Very good. Aren't you glad for the grace of God that truly is greater than all our sin? That the grace of God cleanseth us from all our sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, but just the fact that God shed his grace upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord's willingness and obedience to go to the cross of Calvary for every single one of us. Uh, tonight we are going to partake in the Lord's table in communion. And uh, again, those songs just kind of helping our focus to be on the Lord and on his sacrifice and on God's grace in our life. And uh, tonight, uh, before we even get to the communion part, I do want to kind of remind us and encourage us uh, in the word of God. And uh, there's four sets of scriptures I want to look at tonight uh, in regards to what communion reminds me of. And what it should remind you of as well. Uh, again, we don't take it lightly uh, to partake in the bread and the juice. Uh, it is to remind us of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us uh, over 2,000 years ago uh, to set us free from the bondage of sin and to uh, give us the power to become, as the Bible says, the sons of God, the children of God. There's a place in heaven provided for us, prepared for us by our Lord and Savior. And again, just want to look at a couple of verses tonight, and I want you to look starting with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we look at the first reminder that, the, that communion or the Lord's table reminds us of, again, I'll probably reiterate some of what I'm saying when we get to the communion part, when we actually partake in the juice and the, uh, the bread. But the fact, I want to again remind us that obviously this is something very important, something very near and dear uh, to every believer's heart. Uh, Jesus instituted uh, this ordinance of partaking in uh, the Lord's table as a reminder of what our Lord and Savior did. So sometimes it is a it's a time of uh, just a solemn time, a time of, to reflect on what God's done for us, to reflect on his goodness, to reflect on his grace in our life and his love. Uh, it's something never to be taken lightly. Uh, it's something that is near and dear to the hearts of God's people. But as we think about the Lord's table or we think about communion, uh, we think about the fact that it reminds us that we're new creatures in Christ. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and you look at verse number 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we think about the Lord's table, we think about what, what it represents. It obviously represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the fact that his, his body was the sacrifice, his body hung on the cross, the blood was shed for the remission of sin. The blood was shed for every single person, not just for a select few, but for all, that all might be saved. And when we think about just being a new creature in Christ, the fact that, you know what, we were bound to sin, but Jesus Christ broke those chains when he cried out, it is finished. The blood of Jesus Christ was enough to pay the penalty that every single person was condemned by the penalty of death because of sin. Every single person is born with a sin nature, and that's why it's important that every single person experiences the second birth, which is through the Spirit of God, through the Holy Spirit, calling on Jesus Christ for salvation, being washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So communion reminds us of the fact we're new creatures in Christ, we have a new nature, Christ dwelling within us. We have the Spirit of God in our life now has sealed us until that day of redemption, the day we see our Lord and Savior face to face. But only do we have a new nature. We have, we're new creatures in Christ. I'm not, I'm not bound to my old self and my old ways anymore. Now I walk with the Lord and Savior. He gives me the power to be able to resist temptation. The Holy Spirit inside of us is cultivating his fruit in our life. So it's manifested in our life that testifies of a life being changed by the power of God. But not only are we new creatures in Christ, but we're also the children of God. It reminds us that, you know what, I'm just not 
a number. I am a child of the king. Look at John chapter 1, if you would. John chapter 1. Again, as we just remind ourselves of the fact that we are new creatures in Christ and we are the children of God, not by anything we've done, but by the power of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, you look at verse 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus Christ, as many as have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, have put their faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, those that have been born again by the Spirit of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, the communion reminds us that we're new creatures in Christ, reminds us we're not bound by sin anymore, Uh, we're not headed in the wrong direction, we're headed in the right direction, which is towards heaven, Uh, we're following the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can have confidence in our new life because we are the children of God. And if we're the children of God, then God is on our side. If God be for us, who can be against us? So again, the first thing communion reminds me of is the fact that we are new creatures in Christ. I am an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. I have a bright future ahead of me, no matter what may lay upon my path between now and the time that I reach uh, glory land, reach the pearly gates and see my Savior face to face. I know I have a bright future because I'm reminded of the fact that I am a child of the King. We talked about that this morning, the fact that Jesus has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there's coming that day that we'll see our Savior face to face. And again, this just represents what Jesus did, laying down his life sacrificially, unconditionally, allowing himself to be, uh, as he told his disciples, basically handed over into the hands of sinful men, being mistreated, being crucified, all because of his love for you and for me, So the chains of bondage could be broken. So we could be set free and we would be free indeed. And we would walk with the Lord and Savior day in and day out. We're looking forward to seeing our Savior face to face one day. Again, the second thing I want us to think about as we think about communion, it does remind us that we are new creatures in Christ. And because we are new creatures in Christ, we have a new life with Christ. We have a new life. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Again, and these are what I'm listing tonight is just a few things. There's more things, and I'm sure that things come to your mind when you sit, when you sit and you and you think about the bread, you think about the juice that you're about to partake in. I'm sure maybe your mind is maybe flooded with thoughts or just some thoughts of just what God's done in your life and how good God's been to you and how gracious God's been to you and where God's brought you from. Again, it is a, is a time to meditate on what God's done in our life, not just the fact that Jesus died for us and he was the substitute. He took our place on the cross of Calvary. Uh, he allowed him his life to be taken so ours would not be taken. Remember, He said he came to give life and to give it more abundantly. I'm sure that you have thoughts that that come to you when you think about what Jesus has done. And those thoughts should come reminding us of the goodness of God, reminding us of his love, reminding us of the fact that life I live now, as Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. As Paul writes to the believers at the church of Galatia, He says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, Paul's saying, the old me has been crucified with Christ. Christ died for me, my old self has been buried because I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
Unfortunately, that old self, those old ways, always want to come back. Uh, the devil doesn't give up uh, on those that he loses to Christ. The chains have been broken. When someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, that, that makes the devil angry, but it makes God happy. Happy that someone would put their faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. And we still, ha we still live in the flesh. We, we still, I should say, we still live with flesh. There's still that struggle of wanting to do right, but sometimes doing wrong. Uh, wanting to please the Lord, but then sometimes not pleasing the Lord. There is that struggle. Paul talked about that struggle of the things I would do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. It's just, it's part of life, but we have that desire. We have the desire like Peter who told Jesus, though all men deny you, I will never deny you. I'm going to live my life for you. I'm going to let you be number one. And the Lord was gracious. The Lord was loving and, and kind of warned Peter, you know, don't be too prideful in yourself. Don't count too much in yourself. But at the same time, we understand, you know, Peter had a love for the Lord. He had walked with him at three and a half years. He had seen great things. He had heard the teachings of Christ. And no doubt he had a desire that, you know what, though somebody else may deny, deny you, there's no way I will because I've walked with you. I've seen you do great things in my life. And yet Peter ends up denying the Lord, and the Lord comes and restores the fellowship. You know, I think about this new life that we have with Christ. The fact is, is as Paul says right here, he says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Paul recognizes and wants to encourage us that the life that we now live needs to be lived with the mindset that my life belongs to Christ. He redeemed me with a precious price, the blood. I now belong to him, but the Lord does not look at me as a slave or a servant, but as a friend, as a child of the king. I can have victory in this life because of the one who lives within me, the one who's given me victory over death and hell because he holds the keys of death and hell, because he won the victory on the cross of Calvary for every single person. And every single person that puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ can stand and on this promise that Paul talks about, Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Never forget, not just as we partake in communion, partake in the juice and the bread, that we just remember it now, but never forget a day in your life, a moment in your life, that God loved you so much that he gave himself for you, that he was willing to lay down his life for you and for me so that we could have life and have that relationship with our Heavenly Father who has given us this life and given it to us abundantly. I also want us to think about what Paul is saying when he says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. If you study out Paul's life, uh, Paul was a murderer. He was a hater of Christians, but he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians, but he was spiritually on the road to destruction in his own life. And the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him, stopped him dead in his tracks, turned his life around. But Paul put his faith and trust in the very one he was trying to persecute because Jesus even asked Paul, he told Paul, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. But Paul, was Paul thought he was doing God's service, thought he was serving the Lord by persecuting those that were contrary to his belief. And yet the Lord Jesus stopped him and changed his life, and Paul testifies that the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me enough to stop me and to show me his grace and to show me that I can have a life that is full, a life that is peaceful, a life that is, that is complete in him. 
And from that moment on, Paul went on to live a life for the Lord, still having hardships, still living life, but yet living it by the faith that the Lord is on my side. Let me ask you this, and and just think to yourself, if Jesus Christ is willing to lay down his life for you and to pay for your sin so that you could have life and have a place in heaven, what is it that he will not do for you? When will he not be there for you? When will he not be enough? Because he is enough. He's always there for us. And he is the completeness of our life. He's the one that satisfies our life. Again, he, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it reminds us we have a new life in Christ because Christ lives within us and helps us to live our life from this moment on. Look at 1 John chapter 5, if you would. The third thing that communion reminds me of is the fact that we have assurance of salvation with God. It reminds us that we have assurance that we do not have to fear of being rejected by God when we see him face to face. We do not have to fear that God is going to say at the moment we see him, I never knew you. Depart from me, thou that workest iniquity, because we've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's no, there is no shadow of doubt in my mind that I am a child of the King, and there's a place prepared in heaven for me. God gives us that assurance in his word. 1 John chapter 5, you look at verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. We don't have to hope that we have eternal life. We can know that we do because God says, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Again, the third thing that this reminds us of, that communion reminds us of, is the fact that we have assurance of salvation. We have assurance of, as the Bible calls it, sonship, that we are part of God's family, that there is a place prepared for us, as Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We have that assurance from God's word, but also because the Holy Spirit inside of us reminds us that we are the children of God. Now, there's going to be times in your life, if it hasn't already happened, it may happen, because when we're not truly walking with God, when we find ourselves sometimes slipping away and, and taking our relationship with God Uh, not as serious as we should, or something happens in our life, we make a wrong decision, it doesn't work out. Sometimes our adversary is right there to say, you know what, you must not be saved. Because God didn't do this for you, God didn't keep this from happening. You know what, you keep messing up, and God just, you know what, you mess up too much, God's not going to forgive you. But again, as, as we read scripture, we find that God shows us through the lives of different people that God's grace surely is sufficient, that God's love is never ending in the life of his child. The fact is, once saved, always saved. There's nothing I did to earn salvation. It was a gift given because of our faith in Jesus Christ, and it's a gift given by God. And if we're in the palm of God's hand, no man, as Jesus said, can pluck us out of the Father's hand nor can we jump out of the Father's hand. There's nothing we can do to lose the gift of salvation that is given by God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it reminds us that we have assurance of salvation. We have this relationship with God. And if we cannot believe God, who can we believe? And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will... 
he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Again, God gives us that assurance of salvation, the fact that we can go to him in prayer and know that God hears us. It reminds us of these wonderful things that we are new creatures in Christ. We are the children of the Heavenly Father, the children of the Creator of the heavens and the universe. And we have this new life in Jesus Christ who helps us to live the life that we have. He knows what our life entails and He will help us day in and day out because He gave Himself for us, because He loves us. And the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are the children of God and nothing can change that. The last thing I want us to think about is found in Titus chapter 2. If you go back to Titus chapter 2 <clears throat> and look at verse 13. Because we are the children of God, because Christ liveth in me, he dwells within me and I have the assurance of heaven. I have the assurance that I will see my Savior face to face. I will not be denied entrance into heaven. We have a hope that's worth looking for. In Titus chapter 2, you look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what? When, they, when we have bad days, there's always a silver lining because Jesus Christ is that silver lining in our bad days. When it seems like nothing's going right, when it seems like we're struggling with things, when it seems like uh, things are just mounting up and we just can't seem to get ahead, we can always look to the author and finisher of our faith and be reminded and encouraged that, you know what, the Lord's on my side and it might be today that I see him face to face. This reminds us of the fact that Jesus is not in a grave. He borrowed someone's tomb for three days, that's all he needed, and he rose by the power of God on the third day, and that tomb is empty, and there's eyewitnesses that prove the tomb is empty, because you cannot keep the giver of life in the grave. Though he allowed himself to die and experience death for all of us when he cried out, it is finished, and the Bible records that he gave up the ghost. He allowed himself to be put into a borrowed tomb. He allowed his body to be there for three days, and on the third day he arose in victory. Not for himself, but for you and for me, he rose in victory. Because he did not die for sins he committed, he died for the sins of the world. Remember, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This reminds us of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, not just for the world, but specifically for me. If God be for me, who can be against me? And the devil wants us to think that he's stronger and greater than Jesus Christ, but he's not. The Bible reminds us that the devil will bow his knee one day. We will see him. The Bible says that all nations will look upon him and say, is this the one? that caused the nations to fear because he is nothing. Jesus Christ is everything. The communion reminds me and reminds us that I am who I am by the grace of God, a child of the King. I have a new life in Christ, a life that's worth living because he lives in me to give me an abundance of life this life that I can experience the grace of God, the love of God, the completeness of God in my life, experience a great, sweet relationship with the God of heaven. And I'm reminded of the fact that nothing can take that away. Nothing can take away the love of God that we've experienced. But Paul mentions and Paul kind of lists a bunch of things. Uh, can, 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 what can take away the love of God. What can cause God to stop loving you? Absolutely nothing. Nothing can stop God from loving us, and that gives us the hope in longing for and looking for 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope because he is our hope. Just some things to think about, some things that the communion reminds us of. Remember, when you think about what Jesus said, he said this was to remind us of what he did. As long as we partook in communion, partook in the juice and the bread that symbolized his broken body and symbolized his bloodshed, he reminds us of the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us that the victory was already won. We don't have to fight for it. The victory was already given to us, and we really don't even have to fight ourselves to live a successful, prosperous life in Christ. He already has given that to us. We just have to surrender to his will, allow him to lead us and to guide us through this life, leaning upon him, trusting him, and always reminding ourselves, my hope is in the Lord. Why don't you take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As Paul writes this letter to the church at Corinth, he had to help a church to get some things in order. The church was a mess. Things were not being done right. People were taking advantage of the Lord's table of communion. Uh, they did not have a, a right mindset towards it. And Paul, being the man that he was, a man who loved the Lord, a man who was very grateful for what God had done in his life, wanted to help this church understand the importance of partaking in what Jesus Christ had instituted on that last night that he was with his disciples when he was betrayed, right before he was crucified. Now Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. There's coming a day when we don't have to do this anymore. This is to remind us of what Jesus has done for us to help us be reminded that, you know what? My life has been bought with the precious blood of Christ. My life belongs to him now. And again, not to be a slave, but so that he can do great and mighty things in our life and show us the love and grace of God. But there's coming a day when we won't have to do this anymore because when we get to heaven, we won't have to be reminded of his death. We will sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and we will... We will have a new life. We will have eternity ahead of us to worship him for what he's given us. A place in heaven, a place in eternity. The full joy of the Lord forever and ever and ever. You go, you keep reading on, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup, uh, cup of the Lord unworthily, being not saved, not trusting the Lord for salvation, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. As Paul reminds and wants to help the church at Corinth to do things right and to have the right mindset towards the Lord's table, towards communion, what it truly means and what our mindset and our heart should be towards it, Paul is doing exactly what he was told. In verse 23, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord. This was something that Paul was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Everything that Paul learned was by the Lord. I want you to look with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 28. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians, but go back to Matthew chapter 28. Because <clears throat> I want us to be reminded of that we do this because our Lord and Savior has commanded it, and he desires for us to do this. 
This is not something that is done so I can receive Christ or receive the gift of salvation. This is done to remind me of what my Lord already did and to remind me, you know what? I'm a child of the king. I already have the gift of salvation, and it was a costly gift. It was a costly gift that was not bought with precious stones, silver, or gold, but bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, you look at verse 19 through 20, back up to verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And we could stop right there at those words that Jesus says and spend the next several minutes, if not hour, talking about the power of Jesus Christ and the fact that he has all power. And if he has all power, what is it, again, he cannot deliver you from? What is it, again, that he cannot give you victory over? He has all power. All power means all. You know, somebody once told me the word all means all. But I had someone else tell me, well, all doesn't mean all. Well, how can all not mean all? Sometimes the devil wants, to, wants us to question what, what the Bible says, question what God means. And when Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, that means he has all power. Just as the demons were obedient to him, and they knew that he was Christ because there would be some that would say, we know who you are. You're the son of God. You're the holy one. And he would, scripture would say, Jesus pretty much told them, be quiet. Don't, don't say a word. And he would rebuke them out of people. There's nothing that Jesus does not have power over. And he wants to give you and me victory in our lives in the things that we struggle with, in the things that we think are not conquerable. That's a correct word. They're not able to be conquered. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Again, Jesus commands for his disciples, for his, uh, those that are called into the ministry to teach people, to teach God's people, to observe what the Lord has said and what the Lord has taught us. And what he's taught us is that this communion, the juice and the bread, which represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ, is something that is to be near and dear to our heart, something that's to be precious to us, something that when we sit to partake in it, we come with a heart that, not heavy, but a heart that is thinking about what it means. Because not only did Jesus command it, and, and he did command that we do this, but he desires us to partake in it. Look in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Now again, as Jesus, right before he ascends back up into heaven, he gives that commandment to those disciples, to those men that were there on that day. That commandment is given to every child of God, every born-again believer, that we are to observe everything he taught, everything that... He taught people everything he commanded. And in Luke chapter 22, we see where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, institutes uh, this communion that we are to partake, partake in, and he had a desire for it. Now, we ought to do what Jesus commands us, but just to even see that Jesus had a desire, had a desire for this. Luke chapter 22, and look at verse uh, 14. Luke 22, yeah, Luke 22, verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. This is the night uh, that he is going to be portrayed. Uh, this is the night they're partaking in the Passover celebration uh, that the Jews would celebrate every year, the Passover, remembering uh, what God had done for the Israelites in bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them out of slavery, 
and how the grace of God uh, redeemed them, bought them, set them free, and how God throughout the generations would walk with them, teaching them, and growing them into a great mighty nation. But he says, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus has been looking for this moment, waiting for this moment. Because again, Jesus knows why he came. Jesus came, he was born to die. And for those years, as he allowed himself to experience childhood, teenage years, even into his 20s, all along he's been desiring for this moment. Desiring for the moment that he's going to willingly lay down his life for the sins of the world, but desiring to institute what he's about to institute. He's been telling his disciples up to this point, he's going to die. He's been telling them, I'm going to be handed over into the hands of sinful men. But he's also been telling them, but I'll rise again in three days. Just different ways he would tell them and kind of preparing them. And, and when you think, when, when you go back and look at John chapter 14, uh, they were starting to get pretty heavy hearted. They were, try, they were starting to, you know, get upset that he, keep, he keeps bringing this up. Because they've enjoyed his company. They've enjoyed walking with him. They've enjoyed being with him. They didn't necessarily enjoy, you know, being on the Sea of Galilee in two different storms. But they did enjoy the calmness of the storm after the fact. They enjoyed the power of Christ in their life. They enjoyed his company, his grace, and his love. So at a point in their life, I mean, they know he's about to leave them. They're not quite sure, you know, what's going to happen. But to be sitting in this upper room with Jesus and Jesus saying, with desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, that, and said take this and divide among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. You know, as again, as he tells them that they're to do this, the Lord had a desire he was waiting for that moment, the moment that he could teach his disciples something very special, something very meaningful. This should never not have meaning to it. I attended a church years ago in my early 20s. Because often, you know, people, people wonder, and I've, I've been asked, you know, how often should you celebrate the Lord's table? How often should you do it? And Jesus says, as often as you do it. The Bible never tells us how many times in a month, in a year we should do it, but just as often as we do it. And, and, and that really is up to each church how often they want to do it. Now, I try to do it every quarter. Every three months. I try especially to do it January, the beginning of the year, and I definitely try to do it in Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving time, and then another time in between there, around uh, Easter time when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I went to, I went to a, a church, I attended a church for a few services, and every Sunday they partook in the Lord's Supper. Okay, that's, you know, that's fine, but I kind of noticed... As I kind of looked around, I wasn't, you know, being judgmental, but looking around, it's like nobody really, you could tell nobody really thought anything about it. It was just part of the service. This is what we do every Sunday. You know, it's just like you, you know what the service is like here. I mean, you know Sunday nights. I mean, every, every, pretty much every service is the same. Sunday, Sunday nights, sing a song, I pray, we sing two songs, then I preach. 
Sunday morning's a different format, but you know what that is. I get up, I greet you, we sing a song, I pray, we sing another song, announcements, piano special, we sing another song, we dismiss the kids. There's a routine to it. And sometimes we fall into routines where it doesn't, we just know what to do, there's no thought to it. And as I sat there in, in this church and noticed, okay, the first Sunday I thought, okay, it's a special Sunday, they're doing communion, they're doing Lord's Table. But then the second Sunday I was there, the very next Sunday, the same thing, and there was, it seemed to be no joy in it. It was just something they did. And that's not what it should ever get to. It should never get to the point, okay, oh, communion, big deal. It really is a time of reflection, reflecting on what Christ has done for me, not only setting me free and paying my sin debt and giving me the power to become a child of God, but the fact I have a relationship with a living God. I've experienced the grace of God in my life. I can, I can think of how God has helped me just in the beginning of this year. And even being reminded that though I have myself challenges ahead of me in this year, I know the grace of God is going to help me through this year. He's going to see me through it. That's what this reminds me of is that I'm not serving a dead God. I'm not worshiping an idol that does not know my name or care one thing about me. I am serving a living God who cares deeply about me, who laid down his life for me so that I can have life and experience the joy, the peace, and the love of God like no one ever can without a relationship with Jesus Christ. When you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the reason why we do this is because Jesus Christ desires for us to remember what he's done for us so that it will help us to keep trusting him, to keep believing in him, to keep following him faithfully as he faithfully is always there for us. Let's have a word of prayer before we continue on. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together this evening. Lord, to be reminded of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The payment of sin once. He only had to lay down his life once to satisfy the payment for sin, to satisfy the righteous judge, you, Lord. His sacrifice is accepted by you. Nothing else needs to be done, and we thank you for it. Father, we do ask that you would bless this time as now we focus on partaking in the Lord's table, partaking in the juice and the bread. I pray, Father, that you would bless each person here, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would draw us unto you, that it would be a special time because we're reminded of how special we are in your eyes because of what you've done for us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as these verses say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Just so we all are reminded and understand verse 27 when it says, unworthily, speaking of someone who's not saved, someone who has not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
If that might be you tonight where you've not fully trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would ask you not to take the juice, not to take the bread. You know, sometimes, even in my own life, I've thought, you know, I'm not worthy enough. You know, I got mad today. I didn't do what God told me to do. And, and I may think, you know what, well, I shouldn't take of it. No, it's speaking about salvation. That's why verse 28 says, let a man examine himself. Are you saved? Are you trusting the Lord as your Savior? Then you can partake in this because it's, again, the Lord commanded us. He has a desire for us to be reminded of what he's done for us. Because sometimes it's true, out of sight, out of mind. Sometimes, you know what, we forget we forget people that aren't around, that we don't see often. We, for, we just forget things that just aren't constantly there. Not that we ever forget that the Lord died for us, but sometimes we do forget to maybe just sit and think about what he's done. To remind us, you know what? If he did that for me, he will definitely help me through this situation. He'll definitely be there for me. But at the same time, we do want to, and I will give you just a couple minutes to spend time in prayer before we continue on. Again, if you're saved, you know Christ is your Savior. You have personally accepted Christ as your Savior. You've put your faith and trust in him. Then you're able to partake in this. Same time, let's spend some time, a couple minutes in prayer, and just asking the Lord, is there any iniquity in my heart that I, I've been struggling with? Is there something that you've been trying to help me with and I've been resisting? Because, again, if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. We don't want anything between our Lord and Savior. It's not that we're perfect. It's not that we're sinless. But let's let God examine our heart and maybe bring to our mind maybe something that we do need to make right with the Lord. So I give you a few moments alone in prayer, and then uh, I'll close with a word of prayer, and we'll continue on. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for, again, the opportunity to be gathered together and to partake in communion, to be reminded of your goodness and your grace and your love towards us. Father, I ask that you would continue to bless our time, continue to speak to our hearts, drawing us closer to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If I can go ahead and have Brother Jim, if you'll go ahead and come up.
ask you, Brother Jim, if you will ask the Lord's blessing over the bread. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. I asked Dylan, would you go ahead and come up here? I'm going to have you ask a blessing over the cup.
After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Again, as this is a picture of the body of the Lord Jesus being broken for us, the bread, picturing the body of the Lord Jesus being broken and being sacrificed for us, the cup of the juice symbolizing his blood that was shed for us, and the fact we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been covered. Uh, the fact that his broken body just testifies of his love for us, that we never have to doubt whether or not God loves us because his love was manifested on the cross of Calvary. Again, as we partake in this and as we think about just what it means and what it reminds us of, one thing it does remind us of is the fact that we can praise his name and sing praises unto him. I want you to look at Psalm 150 because if you were to go back and look at that night when Jesus was betrayed by Judas, he encouraged his disciples that would remain faithful to him and singing a song before they left that upper room and went over the brook Kidron into the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible reminds us in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And what God's created in us, some may have voices that can be heard, but we all have a heart that can be seen by God. And we ought to praise the Lord because that is what's in our heart. And Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. 